All right, apologies for going over in class today, but that was probably going to be expected. It was Tyrannosaurs after all. I mean, hey, let's face it. Oh, yeah, and uh, yeah, here we go. And uh, uh, here we go. So, yeah, Tyrannos, they're my guys. So anyway, this conclusion to today's lecture are going to look at another branch of primitive solarosaurs, that is the ostrich dinosaurs, which are also cool, but in a very different way. So uh, we saw, as I wrapped up on the live part of today's lecture, that we've reached a phase where solarosaurs and theropods in general switch from being primarily carnivorous to primarily being non-predatory, and maybe omnivores or herbivores, or we'll see insectivores and so forth. Um, and our first big branch of that, the other relatively primitive branch of solarosaurs, um, in, com in comparison to tyrannosauroids, are the ornithomimosauria. So the ornitho in this, as in ornithischi and so forth, that's bird. The mime there as is mimic. So the bird mimic lizards named after this genus, ornithomimus. Some people say ornithomimus, either is fine. Ornithomimosaurs are known from the early Cretaceous of Europe, Africa, and Asia. In the late Cretaceous, though, they seem to be limited to the late Cretaceous of Asia and North America, a pattern we have heard before. Um, so that said, there may be some dinosaurs in other parts of the world in the late Cretaceous, which are ornithomimosaurs, and there had to have been Jurassic ornithomimosaurs. There's some fragmentary basal solarosaurs, uh, fragmentarily known, that are probably early representatives of ornithomimosauria. We just can't confirm that at present. So what makes an ornithomimosaur an ornithomimosaur? Well, other than one of the most primitive, they share this trait. This is the manus, that's digits 1, 2, and 3. And unlike in most theropods, or indeed most dinosaurs, in which metacarpal 1 is much shorter than metacarpals 2 and 3, and 4 and 5 if they have them, in orthomimosaurs it's almost as long, in some cases it's even as long or longer than the others. And so the hand has switched from the ancestral dinosaurian hand where the thumb comes in at a markedly different angle than the other two, to something that more hooks and clamps. So this is part of that set of adaptations where they're moving away from an actual grasping hand in the sense of something clutching on to food. This is better for clamping on to something. Early ornithomimosaurs are, generally speaking, not particularly large animals. They're not tiny, they're not dinky, but you see here in that one meter scale. And the most primitive one that's relatively well known, at least, is this one, Pelicanomimus. Here's the skull of this dinosaur, and we can see some transformations. For one thing, it's a very long, narrow skull. Um, it has lost teeth in much of the jaw. It actually has the most teeth of any theropod, which is weird, because this group, as we will see later on, is characterized by toothlessness. So it's funny that the theropod with the most teeth is from a group that generally lacks teeth. But you can see how tiny those little teeth are and concentrated at the front. Now here's the orbit and the antiorbital fenestra, and there is the nerus. So here is a better known, somewhat later ornithomimosaur. And we see it's got its small head and quite a long neck. Uh, they oddly mounted this specimen in its death position, which is how it was found on the ground, and then just mounted it in life position. So it looks, it was discovered in the 70s, which is why it's disco dancing, I suppose. It actually was discovered in the 70s. So. Now, there are some early branches of ornithomimosauria. Um, they typically look something like this, so relatively long-legged, uh, long-armed with the, the sort of cl clutching, well, not really clutching, but hooking and clamping arm, small head for picking at small animals and probably plants as well. And then we get this clade of toothless forms. And within that clade, there's actually two major subdivisions. These are the ornithomimoids, uh, ornithomim or ornithomimoidia. You don't need to know that name, but that's what it is on the cladogram. At least some of them lived in herds, so we have these specimens found where multiple individuals from different age stages are found together. Ones of the same color were the same age at time of death. 
And it looks like what happened here is they got mired down in quicksand, basically, that the flock was running over, hit a patch of quicksand, and some of them got stuck, and those are the ones that were sadly preserved. So within the ornithomimoids, we have two branches, both of which are characterized by toothless beaks. The better known one um, is ornithomimidae. This is the clade of ornithomimus itself, so the name literally is bird mimic. These are restricted to the late Cretaceous of Asia and North America, not just Western North America. We definitely had them on our side of the continent. They have toothless beaks. They also, this is the clade of ornithomimosaurs that evolves an arctometatarsus. Now, I just explained the arctometatarsus earlier today in the Tyrannosaur lecture. These guys evolved it independently. And given their relatively small body size, you can see a person for scale, um, and the fact they have the very long slender legs and the long arctometatarsi, and go back to the tyrannosaur part of this lecture to look at the limb proportions there. These were probably among the fastest of all dinosaurs, basically them, some of the larger truodontids that we'll get to on Monday, and uh, young tyrannosaurids would all sort of vie for the fastest of the theropod dinosaurs. So here's a body plan of Struthiomimus, or Struthiomimus, one of the best known forms. The name literally is ostrich mimic, not a bad name. And we could see its skull in CT scan form, um, totally toothless, so covered by a keratinous beak, a beak of keratin. Now, seven years ago to the day, that's the reason I definitely wanted to get this recording done, because it's to the day, seven years ago, this dinosaur became less of a mystery. This is Dinochirus. Dinochirus was discovered the year I was born, 65. Uh, it was first named in 69 or 70, I believe, around then. And all that the team had, it was a Polish team working in Mongolia, were the scapula coracoids and the forelimbs that went with it and a couple vertebrae. They're gigantic. They're about eight feet long the longest arms of any dinosaur that had been found, and still have been found. What was the creature? Well, it's clearly a theropod. But honest to goodness, um, although some people were trying to make this into some large predatory form, various researchers, including John Ostrom, uh, who I talked about towards the beginning of the course, we'll re-encounter him again when we talk about bird origins, looked at the metacarpals of these things. This is an ornithomimosaur. It has those, the long metacarpal one, like other ornithomimosaurs, it's just an ornithomimosaur grown huge. And so most of us had this image in the 1980s and 90s and early 2000s that that's what this was. You take something like ornithomimus or struthiomimus or golymimus and just make it even bigger. But then seven years ago today, this skeleton and other skeletons that had been discovered and were being were being analyzed for the few years previously were finally released uh, in a paper that came out and our view of Dinochirus and its family the Dinochiridae changed yes they are ornithomimosaurs but they are not ostrich mimics in any way shape or form they have a very different body plan than their smaller slender cousins first of all they don't show elongation of the metatarsus it's the ancestral stumpiness uh, not the really long, stretched-out form that you would expect. Um, they, we'll back this up here. They have, at least in Dinochirus, a sail, or at least very long neural spines, actually probably to accommodate muscles to help hold in this, which is a big barrel gut. So as opposed to being relatively sleek, fast-moving animals, this is a slow-moving, beer-bellied animal. Um, it's got sort of a broad tail, not a slender tail. Well, it's not going to need a slender tail to, you know, dash back and forth to help it keep it agile. This is no way of being agile. This big ilium flared forward to attach hip uh, muscles, again, to sort of help support this beer belly. And the skull is truly weird. It's toothless, but the infratemporal fenestra, almost totally gone. The supratemporal fenestra, really tiny. So a really weak bite, uh, at least based on the muscles from up here. A massive, or at least a very broad, lower jaw. And almost a duckbill shape. So this is a weird animal. Now the diets of ornithomimids proper and early ornithomimosaurs was already in a bit of question. 
they probably were something like ostriches and emus and rheas, which are omnivores. They eat small-bodied animals, like small mammals, small reptiles, insects, and so forth. Um, they also eat a lot of plants. They also eat eggs. Dinochirus probably ate those as well, but it was also found with a whole bunch, like hundreds of fish bones in its belly. So it was probably eating small fish. It lived in an environment with lakes and streams, but it may have been, those, those fish were so tiny, it may have actually been going after water plants and sort of dabbing up the fish as well. So a very, very odd animal, unlike anything that we had uh, predicted this animal would be like. You know, honest to goodness, those of us who recognized it was an ornithomimosaur still pictured something that was basically just like a big ornithomimus with slightly stumpier legs. And no, it shows that nature is weirder than we expect it to be. Here's the reconstructed skeleton. You can see it for size. It rivals the bigger Tyrannosaurus. It's not quite as big as the biggest Tyrannosaurus rex in terms of mass, but it's close. It's a giant. It's a it's maybe six to seven ton giant compared to Tyrannosaurus as at eight to nine. Now, to wrap up this lecture, there are specimens of Ornithomimus found in North America that have what some people interpret as indications of penaceous feathers. Those are feathers that have a shaft, branches coming off the shaft, and little branches coming off that. So a feather-like feather, rather than a fuzz-like feather. Not everyone is 100% convinced of these evidence. It's not preserved in quite as good an environment as the lake deposits that we have the really definite feathers in. But it could be. And in fact, the people who described it think that the long feathers, the broad feathers, are only on the arms, they're not on the tail or the legs, and that the young individuals don't show it. It's possible, that might make sense, especially if these were for display, or maybe for brooding the eggs, uh, but it's not definite at all. But we'll say for the moment, we'll take them at this analysis word, and say yes, that at Ornithomimosauria we have penaceous feathers, at least on the arm. When we pick up the groups next time, we'll get to forms that definitely have penaceous feathers and over more of the body. So just to show you this d development of feathers, a quill, so a hollow tube, is the ancestral state. And we know this both inferred from the distribution of phylogeny, but also from developmental biology. If you take the genes that activate feathers, the first set that activate would just produce a hollow quill, if nothing else activates. But when the next set activate, they produce this, plumulose feathers, down or fuzz. And remember, there's many types of primitive dinosaurs that show this. And then in these advanced silurosaurs, that's where we get the panaceous feathers, which require other genes to activate in development. So we have one of these initial structures becomes the central shaft, and the others start gluing onto that. So that takes us through the basal parts of Silurosauria, what I consider the acme of dinosaur evolution, but I know I'm not, I'm not the only authority in dinosaurs, and many people are interested in the branches that are yet to come. So on Monday, we will get to Maniraptora, the fully feathered dinosaurs. Take care, and see you on Monday.